I welcome all. Uh, thanks to the Philips team uh, for inviting me to give this lecture. So without wasting time, I'll go to the topic proper. I welcome all the delegates who have joined in on the Sunday morning. So today's discussion is on approach to complex atrial septal defect device closure. So we'll be discussing uh, mostly on the interventional part. Um, I am aware that the Philips webinar series have already uh, covered many uh, aspects of atrial septal defect, starting from imaging, the basic imaging interpretation, as well as some of the gray zones uh, in evaluation and management. So today's topic, will, we will be more concentrating on the therapeutic part, uh, that is precisely the transcatheter means of uh, closing an atrial septal defect. So as we discussed, we'll be talking about tips and tricks of ASD closure. It is very crucial to have a thorough understanding of the anatomy. Uh, that is uh, needless to say. And to add it on that, we need the skill set with modified techniques for a successful intervention. Understanding anatomy is a base for all structural intervention and ASD um, being the first structural intervention, uh, we, um, first structural intervention which has come into the cath lab um, is not an exception for this. So understanding the anatomical nuances of a sexual defect is very important for a structure, for a successful intervention. Morphological variables in natal septum, uh, they do challenge the intervention closure. So that's what one has to be very thorough with the imaging aspect of ASD. The size, the location, the boundaries or the margins are also very crucial in understanding the atrial septal defect. Now, why do uh, we need to know each and everything in precise manner? Because we have to intervene transcathetic means. For the surgeons, this much preciseness is not probably required because he's going to openly see it and to see the defect under naked eye and he can, um, on the table, he can see all the various anatomical differences. But that is unfortunately not applicable for us. So we have to get all the details before we undertake a case. The rims, the so-called margins, are always highlighted whenever someone is talking about intervention closure. It is very interesting to know that the measured rims, if they are adequate, will give a lot of confidence. But unfortunately, the measured rims do not actually tell us the strength to hold the device. So that is making this uh, interventions more challenging, at the same time, more interesting. So the rims measured by a transesophageal or transthoracic echocardiography do not actually tell us their strength to hold the device, okay? Let us see what are the anatomical variables uh, which are being confronted with. Size. Uh, some will say that as an ASD size doesn't matter as long as the margins are okay. Partially not true. Why? Let's see. The, the size does matter in clinical practice, whether you like it or not. A large ASD of more than 20 millimeter in a child or a large ASD, more than 30 millimeter in an adult, is always a concern. Whenever a child is coming to you with a, uh, with a echo diagnosis of ASD measuring 20 millimeter or 25 millimeter, there are always butterflies in my stomach because we really don't know uh, what are the margins. In our experience, we found that a larger defect obviously have to have some deficient margins because the atrial septal area is something which is very definite for a particular body surface area. Now, if you have a larger defect, obviously it is going to take a lot of area under, under the septum. So leaving the margins as deficient in, on one side or other side. So that is a take home message. If you have a larger defect, invariably they will have associated complexities. And of, of course the larger defects, because they have deficient margins, and they, they, have, they have other associated anomalies like uh, malalignment of the septum, they often require modified techniques to deploy. So, so starting from the size, it, say, it, it tells you that where the complexity begin. And whenever you have an adult which is measuring, having an A defect, defect measuring more than 40 millimeter, more often than not, you require a custom made devices which you need to tell the company to make it for that particular patient. So in nutshell, the size definitely do have an impact on your planning and execution. And what is the adequacy of a rim? Like we discussed, the rim what we measure in an esophageal echo or a, or a transthoracic echo, they really may not always be the one we actually see and measure. A rim which you can measure may not actually be the true rim that we see. 
if someone has say that if there is adequate trim we never know whether this adequate enough to hold the device let us see this uh, image this patient uh, uh, has a central defect this is a 3d echo the location of the defect and the rims is very important suppose that someone is having a central hole like this as you can see this is an oval defect so that means it has got a major axis like this and it's got a minor axis on that so if you have a major axis and a minor axis most of the defects are kind of major and minor most of the defects are ellipsoid or oval and they may be central or they may be peripheral somewhere superiorly and posteriorly somewhere superiorly and anteriorly or sometimes very inferiorly now obviously if it's a central hole we believe that the margins are adequate whereas a peripherally located defect obviously will have some margins like a superior posterior defect will have a deficient posterior margin an anterior superior will have definitely have a deficiency of the retroaortic tissue an inferior defect definitely will have deficient infra posterior rim this to add to the complexity if it's a very large defect which is inferior and posterior what do you say you have deficient infra posterior rim so location of the defect has its own impact on the successful outcome the size of the defect also have its own impact on the outcome so the central versus peripheral is very very important and we should also know that a retroaortic rim is absent in about 40 to 50% of patients in all published series including ours that goes to show that if you have a large defect if you have a large defect it's going to take the entirety of the atrial septum and that will lead to deficient both only deficient not only deficient anterior margins but also post deficient posterior margin making the intervention more and more challenging so the rims are defined with pretty much standard now so there there was a near up about 7 years 8 years back where people were defining rims Uh, as they see and there were the, the 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 language was not very common but now i think we have pretty much set into a specific pattern of defining this images so that the echocardiographer is speaking in the same language as the interventionist the and the following six the following five um, aged rim should be evaluated before the procedure the anterior rim is you see the aorta so this we can exactly see in our trans esophageal 3d echo so this we call it as the aorta so the iota will cause a bulge onto the when you see this is actually the surgeon's view when we are seeing the asd in fast from the right atrium so the iota will be anteriorly and superiorly the spc and the right upper pulmonary vein will be the posterior and superior margin we have the posterior and the infra posterior margin significantly contributed by the ipc margin and of course we have the antero inferior which is contributed by the atrio ventricular valves so with this definition of the rims let us go and see what are the variables we are dealing with especially when a complex asd is referred to you so for several morphological complexities in asd that can face uh, cause a challenge in intervention as i told you asd is a bit are large more than or more than or equal to 30 mm in an adult or more than a 20 mm in a child multiplicity when you have multiple defects obviously the challenges are many because you need to take a call whether you need to close all the defects or close a larger one and leave the smaller one and of course the choice of device also will differ in multiple asds and that is an aneurysm of the septum the septum is aneurysm it's very difficult to image the entire septum in one plane malalignment of the septum we will discuss that and then of course rim deficiency or so called floppiness of the septal margins the frequency of morphological variation variations the most common as i have as already alluded to deficient retroaortic rim which is seen about 40% of cases a deficient infra posterior rim this rim is very crucial to hold the device so that's been reported in about 12% of cases a perforation of the aneurysm of the septum of 7% multiplicity of defects in a, again around in 7% of cases a combined deficiency of mitral and aortic rim one should not get confused here the de true deficiency of a mitral limb alone will take this into account not something which we are which we intervene but a combined some of the patients who have deficiency of the aortic rim 
may have a combined deficiency of mitral and iotic ring. So that is been noted in about a minority, about three to four percentage of cases. A deficient SPCRM, again, this should not be confused with a superior vena cable type of AST. So that's a deficient, and also secondum AST, which is posterior but a deficient SPCRM is also a rare phenomenon, but can happen. A deficient coronary sinus ring can also be seen in about one percentage of cases. This is our own data. We have uh, um, thoroughly imaged in our more than 500 cases and our treatment um, outcomes that we have reported in. And very interestingly, we, our data is also tallying with those uh, coming from the CAT-CV data. We found this larger ASD measuring more than 25 millimeter in about almost 50% of the cases, 48.2. Very large ASD, more than 35, no, about 20% of cases. Malaline septum in 24, multiple ASDs in about 8%. Septal aneurysm in about seven. Deficient posterior septum in 26.9 percentage and about deficient IVC margin is about 15.2. Well, conventionally it has been told that whenever you have a deficient IVC rim, you should not take the patient for a device closure. But see our data, about 15 percentage of patients have deficient and floppy inferior rim. What does it show? It does show that the interventionalists, as they grow with their experience, they are able to try the device even in cases where the outcome is going to be suboptimal or it they may fail. So it, that show one on one side it shows the the growth of the transcatheter means for, for closing this ASD, and on the other hand, it also points a word of caution that as we take more and more complex defects, our success percentage is going to come down from the higher 90s to late 80s, something like 88 to 89 percentage. At the same time, the complications also can go up. So deficiency of an AS rim. The strength of the, I will just highlight the salient points what we discussed so far. The strength of the rim is more important than the length, but unfortunately, imaging does not tell us the strength of the rim. We can have a rough estimate as to the thickness of the rim, the brightness of the tissue, which is at the inferior vena cava location or the superior vena cava location or the posterior margin, and will predict, can predict, say that, okay, the rim the, the rims in okay, but again, it is arbitrary and subjective. By convention, it has been de denoted that a, a margin of five millimeter is good. It holds good for majority of cases, but not in all cases. There have been cases where we have 3mm margins or 2mm margins and the device was sitting very nice. At the same time, a margin of 7, 8 millimeter could not hold the device. So again, this is going to be a quite subjective or arbitrary. We have to define on individual case to case basis. Deficient aortic rim does not represent an absolute contraindication for the device closure. I will discuss this when we discuss the 3D. An aortic rim has, uh, is not a must for a device because the device is going to clasp on to the aortic bulge on the atrial septum and not on the aortic tissue or aortic septal tissue. So that means uh, aortic rim deficiency is something which is quite okay for the device. Whereas the inferior vena cable and the posterior rims are very, very important in holding the device. Most defects are ellipsoid as we saw in the image and size varies with the cardiac cycle. One must also remember that the device, the device what we use is circular. A circular device is being used to close an ellipsoid or ovoid defect. So there is a challenge in that. Why it is a challenge? The challenge is in the sizing. We have a major axis which is measuring 20 millimeter and the minor axis which is measuring 10 millimeter. What is the device is going to take? Most of in our cases, we go with the major axis and do not upsize. We take a 20 mm and then see how the device is sitting. The major axis diameter of the defect is measured in the face of a ventricular end systole, and that is something we should always remember because that is at the face of the cardiac cycle where the atrial septal defect is measured in the maximum length. So the 2D TE, which still forms the backbone of our imaging technique, and let us see what are the anatomical variables of complexity what we see in our routine practice. So this is the 2D, I think uh, I need not uh, explain this in detail because most of the attendees do know what are the basic principles of T imaging in an ASD. So this is a short axis T transesophageal echocardiographic imaging. This is IOTA, LARA, and this is ASD. And this is what is being told as a retroaortic tissue, the small projection we see, which is actually in the region of the septum secundum. And this is the um, 
so, so called the long axis view or the um, sagittal plane view, we can see the posterior margin, which is um, showing as the, uh, the um, posterior most location of the septum. If you come to panel C, this is actually the true posterior rim where we can actually measure the, uh, sorry, the, we, we see the, the 90 degree vertical view, the so-called the bicable view, where we see the inferior vena cable margin as well as the superior vena cable margin. Sometimes it's very difficult to see both ASPC and ABC in one plane. In this case, actually we see the very beautiful IVC rim here, which seems very pretty good for hold the device. And we just a little bit of counterclockwise rotation, we get to see this ASPC margin, which also puts quite good. And we can always see that in an anterior posterior plane we measure here. So this is in short axis, we measure the anterior and true posterior rim uh, length. And then in the, in the, in the 90 degree view, inferior margins. We call it as the anterior posterior and supero inferior. And that gives us the, the, the orientation of the which way is long axis lying in. In this case, the long axis in the anterior posterior plane. This is an anomaly where you can see that there is complete baldness of the retroiotic tissue. So this is aortic uh, cusp, non-coronary cusp, right coronary cusp. Here we can see that there is complete absence of the atrial um, septum secundum and there is a complete baldness of the retroiotic tissue. This is not a contraindication for IOT device, but mind you, uh, many of the cases we have find extremely difficult uh, to, to, to put the device in such anatomy, especially when we have a um, deficient posterior margin. Even in cases where there is a complete bald of retroiotic tissue, you should not take it for granted that that intervention will be smooth and uncomplicated. This is a case where there is deficient posterior margin and then uh, you can see this is a long axis 125 degrees. We see that the right upper pulmonary vein that there is a true def deficiency of the true posterior margin. This is a sinus venous as ASD. The sinus venous should not be confused with an absent ASVC rim. So sinus venous as ASD, as you know, is a completely embryologically different entity and it, it is associated with anomalous uh, superior pulmonary vein, right superior pulmonary vein uh, drainage. And it is actually a, a congenital absence of the separation which uh, has to happen between the RUPV as well as ASD. Whereas this is actually a superiorly and posteriorly located ASD where there is deficient SVC margin. The arrowhead is actually showing, is showing you the septal tissue here, which is um, supposed to hold um, the device. This patient actually intervened successfully. So, but this case shows us that the SVC margin is deficient. A very high posterior septum secondum defect uh, may get confused with the sinus venous as ASD. We should understand that the secondum ASD will always have some settled tissue. This we should clearly understand. That that will separate from the SVC. And SVASD, as we discussed, it's a completely different animal altogether. Many people won't know, like a superior vena, uh, sinus venous as ASD, there is an entity called inferior sinus venous as ASD. What does it mean? This is actually a uh, variant of uh, atrial septal defects, which is located very, very inferiorly. And how will you diagnose? This may look on the, on the first instance as a ASD, which is in OS ASD, which is located inferiorly. But the, the key points are an intact fossa valis. You should understand that the fossa valis is intact. Absence of septal residual tissue. If it were an inferiorly located OS ASD, it will have some septal tissue which is separating from the inferior vena cava. If you don't have a septal residuar with near the ABC, it is very unlikely that it is going to be a, you have a traditional OSASD. And about 15 to 20 percentage of cases, they have anomalous right inferior pulmonary vein. Please note that unlike sinus venous ASD in the classical superior location where RUPV anomaly is a, by default, Right, that means right upper pulmonary vein has to be anomalous. In inferior sinus venous, sinus venous of ASD, that is not the case. Only one fourth to one fifth will have an anomalous right upper pulmonary vein. Sorry, right lower pulmonary vein. So this is a case where a deficient IVC margin, this will always give butterflies in your stomach whenever you try a device closure in 
um, deficient inferior margin cases. Most of our embolizations happen with this kind of anomaly. As I alluded to, about 15% of uh, cases in our series had deficient margin. So this is one of the important anomaly we should always be looking for, and you should, it should predict your success rate. Now, this has been confirmed by the 3D, but there is a very deficient inferior vena cable margin or the inferior margin of the OAS, ASD. So deficient IVC margin is a big no for ASDs, but again, as we experience grows, there are some cases which we ultimately take up for devising. This is a, a case of ours which has a deficient aortic tissue, a deficient posterior tissue. And whenever you see diametrically opposite points in a short axis view, uh, anterior and posterior showing deficiency, it is always going to be a challenge. And without a modified technique, it is very difficult to close such defects. So this patient, actually, these are snaps uh, of echocardiography in the cath lab. This patient had a deficient aortic rim, deficient posterior rim. Uh, this is actually a sizing balloon, which is being put across the defect. And with a balloon assisted, the LA disc is deployed first. And then the RA disc, you can see a dumbbell shaped device uh, because it is partially constricted by the balloon. And as, of, as we deflate the balloon, you can see the LA disc coming back to the iota, snugly holding it. And the RA disc is also slowly getting near the aortic tissue. And very beautifully, we can see that the, iota, the, the LA disc is now abetting very closely to the iota and the RA disc is also coming. So this is so-called the aortic bulge. When we see in 3D, we will know. The aortic bulge, which comes into the atrial septum, we call it aortic torus or something like the bull's head. And another important thing to note is actually the, the, the LA disc and RA disc seems to converge towards the inferior margin. So once you get such a echocardiographic picture, it is pretty sure that the device is going to stay there. We call it the V sign, actually. There is something called a V sign, whereas the both LA and RA disc are converging towards the inferior septum. And this is the final image after withdrawal of the balloon and release of the um, screw. So this we see that the, the disc is uh, abutting uh, both the disc. This is a challenge. Once we cross the inferior rim deficiency, the next important anatomical challenge, which can have a lot of issues in the cath lab, is actually multiple defects. And multiple defects usually happen in the context of aneurysmal septum. So that gives more challenge because we are the measurement of the defects becomes a big challenge. So this is ASD number one, which is relatively posterior. This is ASD number two, which is anterior. And we have an, a, a, a septal aneurysm, which by definition is excursion of more than 15 millimeter. So this is a pretty challenge. And then most of the time we close the, close one bigger hole and leave a smaller hole. But if you want to device the device them, um, the, the recommended device is not the classical double number lot type and blast of self-centering device, but the non-self-centering type, something like a gore or a helix, which are um, a very good option in such cases of perforated aneurysmal septum or so-called multiple defects with aneurysmal septum. We'll discuss this. Multiple ASDs, as we discussed, it's a challenge. This patient had a large anterior defect and there's a small posterior defect. And the color flow is confirmed the same. And this is a four chamber view which shows a very large aneurysmal bulge of the atrial septum. Now, how this is going to be challenging. The challenging with atrial septum aneurysm is, first of all, when we have an aneurysm, it's very difficult to really see whether there is an ASD is there or not. So that is something which is going to be first ruled out. False dropouts are very common because septal tissue is not in one plane, it's in a C-shaped or L-shaped uh, plane. It's very difficult in transimaginal imaging cuts, uh, transimaginal imaging cuts to see whether there is a real ASD is there. Sometimes false dropouts can be seen. Adequate sizing becomes an issue. We may have to take a sizing balloon in all of the cases. Oversizing will become an issue, especially when we are using a self-centering device. A device which violates the normal fluoroscopic appearance. So somebody who is very tuned to a fluoroscopic appearance of the device will, be, will get fooled by this uh, very remarkably variant uh, aneurysmal septum. So this is actually an image of a, a multiple ASD case. Actually, we didn't find the the um, we didn't find the multiple ASD in the in the in the echo lab. And the device looking is quite uh, quite okay, but it's not uh, somebody who's doing has done a lot of ASD intervention. We know that this is not a normal appearance in an LA view. And this is an image in Francis of Agileco, which got us confused. The patient was after positioning the device, the patient was uh, kept in the cath lab for nearly an hour to make sure that the device was uh, sitting properly because 
you can see that there is an additional tissue which is there, there is an additional defect which is um, there anteriorly which was not picked up earlier what happened was that once the, the device was kept in the major the major hole um, it, it eventually pulled the whole septum in such a way that it opened up an anterior defect which was shunting and it was measured about two millimeters so that we had just left it but actually it gave a lot of anxious moment in the catalog even after releasing the device uh, we were expecting an embolization so we kept for about almost a half an hour the patient on table before shifting her out and this is an image uh, we have um, acquired a few months later uh, to see to compare the appearance and then the echo image is showing almost the same you can see that the device has uh, started endothelializing as well but these are some of the anatomical nuances which can get confused you now coming to the septal malalignment one must be aware of in our series about 20 percentage of the cases were malalignment cases and in addition to the deficient ivc margin this was one of the anatomical entity which was predicting of uh, success uh, sorry predictive of uh, intervention failure so to understand uh, septal malalignment we should uh, remember this cartoon so whenever you see a transesophageal course short axis view we should remember that, that the atrial septal differentiation plane between LA and RA, if you draw a line, that should cross through the interface of a left coronary cusp and right coronary cusp. So this is in a normal situation. And when you put a device, the device has to align such a way that the LA disc is on one side posteriorly and the RA disc has to be one on one side anteriorly. But in septal man alignment, the septal differentiation plane is in a completely different uh, um, alignment as opposed to a coronary uh, alignment. What happens is that uh, when we put the device, the device is going to tip more posteriorly because the septum is malaligned posteriorly. The device is also going to be malaligned posteriorly. And that causes a friction between the right tibia disc and the iota and lead to impingement. There have been some reports of late cardiac erosion um, because of uh, malalignment, even though we have not noted any of these uh, cases in about, uh, in our series of about 500 cases, we had uh, close to about uh, 97 or 98 cases. We haven't seen an erosion so far now but I think this is something we should be very carefully following it up. So this is again the same malalignment case, which, which was showing uh, the impingement of the right titter disc onto the iota. Uh, we can note it in the 3D as well. And uh, this was actually remaining like that. Uh, this is uh, a little bit uh, worry, worrisome, uh, but the patient is doing well. So these are some of the issues we must be aware of. And alignment is very difficult with the disc unless you use a, use a balloon or any other modified techniques. So with that, I think what we understand now with the imaging part and complex ASD is that a comprehensive knowledge of the septum is a key. There is a conundrum or confusion in seeing a defect as a whole with the rim deficiency. So you should, we should be able to see or envisage or conceptualize the defect uh, in a three-dimensional fashion in our mind before we take the patient in the catheter. For that, I think a complete soup of 2T is more important than rather than dedicated arbitrary angulation views, which we are accustomed uh, to acquire in a routine uh, transit of Agileco. Now we come to 3D. This is an exciting and fashionable way to learn and display. Uh, we often, when we 3D came into the foray, we thought 3D may not be useful for ASDs. But I think that concept has changed over the past three or four years. We have been very dedicatedly using this technique for improving our knowledge of understanding. Now why it has come to our foray is because many of the cases where we think that we will successfully close the device with the 2D, good 2D knowledge, we fail. And then these, some of these cases, actually, the 3D has given us some important information as to why we failed. The status of 3D echo. And it was, I would say this is a very huge leap forward in the case of ASDs to understand. I have not uh, um, declined a case or selected a case based on only through 3D criteria. We do not have a dedicated 3D protocol which helps us in selecting or deselecting an individual case. I think this is applicable for all the leading interventions as well. Overall, it adds to our 2D knowledge and conclusions. And our selection is entirely based on 2D even now. But I'm aware many of uh, operators in the West are now slowly moving to an exclusive 3D based uh, device selection as well as case selection. I would say probably the 3D knowledge in our lab has gained has been entirely gained based out of the 2D basic skeleton. It definitely helps uh, that I'm very sure, but not to the point that I think we will select or deselect a case. I have to tell this because this is something uh, the, for the audience who are um, relatively younger and newer, they sh I should spend some time on 3D because this is going to be there for the future. 
there are basically three modes we play around with in 3D and we will focus on what is there for the AST. The live 3D mode, which is actually the real time imaging. Sorry for making this slide quite busy and then didactic, but please understand and uh, listen to me. I will make it as slow as possible. A live 3D mode is one, which is a real time imaging and it requires a real time continuous sharing of the probe. It gives us a wedge shaped 3D structure about 15, 20 degrees. And it, it is associated with a rapid volume rate and better resolution. So the first one is live 3D mode. The second one is a 3D zoom. This is again a live real time 3D imaging. The sample of our volumes are operator defined. We ha can have additional rotation required and slowest volume rate. So this is 3D zoom. The third one, which is a, the most comprehensive and time, time consuming and the offline mode is the 3D volume, 3D full volume. So that is something which is not a real time imaging and it is associated with about continuous sample volumes about five to six and they are clubbed together sequentially. You do it offline. This is prone to switch artifact as some of you would know. But again, I would say that the live 3D mode, the 3D zoom mode is more than enough for our ASDs. We probably will dedicate the 3D full volume for all of our mitral and other valvular interventions. But for and how will you get the live 3D mode? Obtain a mid esophageal four chamber view of the ASD. I will go as low as possible. So, first you get a four chamber view of the ASD. Now, we insert push deeper by 10 15 centimeter, apply a full anti flexion, and then rotate the transducer about 90 degree clockwise and withdraw to get a deep transcastic LVOT. I think this is the most important step I would right to request the younger people to practice, we should be able to get a good LVOT deep transgastric view. And once you get that, the moment you switch to 120 degree, you get a good sagittal view of the ASD. And the, this, in this cartoon, the step number three and step number four are the most important. Remaining the machine will do for you. So if you get a good sagittal view of the ASD, then you launch a live 3D. And then turn 90 degree image to right around the vertical axis. And then you do an elevation width adjustment as well as lateral width adjustment to get an RA and fast view. In ASD, we always say to get an RA and fast view because that will help us to in getting it a parallel or similar to what surgeons see after opening the RA, the so-called surgeon see. For that, the SPC will become in a 12 o'clock position. Just like we keep for mitral, we keep the IOTA at 12 o'clock. We keep SPC at 12 o'clock for the ASDs. Now for the 3D zoom mode, the second mode, again, you get a mid esophageal view, long 3D zoom, adjust regions of interest in both right and left multiplanar image panels, and then do a 3D zoom, and then flip the front edge to get an RA and fast view. Once we get an RA and fast view, you rotate it so that you get SVC at 12 o'clock. You can always flip it 180 degree to get the LA part of the ASD. We will discuss this. The third one, which may not be exclusively applicable for ASD, so I won't really recommend somebody who's starting with ASDs, uh, 3D, uh, 3D full volume may not be the one which you should be worried about. So again, this one I will uh, just briefly discuss. You should get an augmented esophageal fourth chamber view. Then you launch a 3D full volume. And uh, after that, you activate the MPR volumes from the ATP and then check the frontal and lateral planes. Then of course you have to launch the eye crop and then adjust the box position and rotation of the left and right MPR panels. And then you use the dial to see the right again back back to the right lateral in fast view again you rotate for to make the spc at 12 o'clock so this is actually a 3d in fast view of the right atrium we can see that uh, the spc this is the um, the the atrioventricular region the so called the right coronary will be in this area so you can see the atrial um, the second term type of asd you can see the remarkable variation in the size of the asd you see that this is a SVC, as I told you. And then here comes the, the right coronary atrial group, the so-called the atrioventricular group. So this is the inferior vena cava. And this is RCA group. You can see that remarkable variation in the HL second term sites. It's relatively um, central, but it's an oval defect. That is an AV valve tissue. This is a posterior margin.
this is a very important uh, image. Uh, I have put a cartoon to make you understand the, the various margins of what you see in 3D. Again, this is SVC. This is a post superior. This is the aortic tor or the so-called bull's head, which is bulging into the atrial wall or the atrial septum. Uh, this is the inferior most portion of the septum. The IVC comes here. And um, this is the atrial valve area. So this beautiful, beautifully will tell us superior SPC, posterior iota, tricuspid valve IVC. So this will help us our understanding. Someone, if you want to teach the anatomy of the ASD, I think 3D is a beautiful way to make it beautiful. This is a 180 degree flip I was telling you. We can see the right upper pulmonary vein. This is from the LA view. There is a mitral valve. This is a descending iota. And this is the right upper pulmonary vein. So that is RUPV. This is aortic torus. So something which is bulging onto the atrial septum or tree wall. So uh, the device, when we put it, actually the device is the LA disc is going to clamp onto this area. Okay, so the tissue in between the iota and the atrial septum is of no value, no, no concern for us. So once you put the device also, you can actually see this from the RA as well as the LA view. Okay, so this is actually a 3D guidance or 3D guided, I would say probably during the procedure, intra-procedure, sheath causing device placement of the disc. And this is after placement of the device and we can get some nice images after placement of the device. So this is again, uh, we have alluded the how the rims of the ASD have to be measured in a 3D echo. The remarkable variations in the size. You can see the late systole is the one where the ASD is going to be very large and the other, other phases of the cycle is showing the remarkable variations in the ASD size. This is the anatomical orientation I was alluding to, the, 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 the so-called surgeon's view, the so-called um, SPC at 12 o'clock view, where we can e easily identify and um, the structures. Again, the aortic torus coming here. So this is a, uh, the LA view showing the RUPV, IOTA, mitral valve, CS, etc. RA and FOS and LA and FOS. This is a case where we have uh, a neurosmal septum. You can see the redundant tissue here, the atrial septum. Most of the, them, them do have two holes or three holes, now depending on the morphology. So here a patient had a larger um, central hole and a smaller peripheral hole. We closed only the larger hole. Now coming to the, the techniques part, um, we have um, discussed about the imaging part. Now the techniques part, how the complex ASD is going to be intervened. Uh, we have definite uh, de different techniques being proposed. One is a balloon assisted techniques, which is very popular in our lab. Second one is a pulmonary vein deployment. The third one is actually a combination of bat and pulmonary vein, which we are um, going to publish it sooner. And a significant proportion of patients who have deficient inferior posterior rim, we find that um, if you combine both BAT and right upper pulmonary vein deployment technique, the success rate improves. So this is actually the combination of one and two. We also have LA roof deployment, which is just an extension of the pulmonary vein deployment. We also have other, other methods like modified sheets technique, the result of sheets, the uh, dilated assisted techniques, and then of course, multiple devices with balloon occlusion techniques. So these are some of the techniques. There are many other techniques which are all published. These are these six techniques are the ones which are we, which we use in our cath lab. So B B A T steps I will allude to. Again, it will be useful for someone who is going to begin. The bilateral femoral axis, vein axis is the one we use. The mostly the right one for the device and the left one for the sizing balloon or the as balloon assistance uh, technique. ASD sizing balloon is the one which we commonly use, which is now all the all the vendors are giving um, the balloons along with the delivery system. So uh, whether it is Abbott, LifeTuck or Cocoon, everybody has their own um, supply of uh, sizing balloons, which which have a marker. This is, these are all super compliance balloons. So the they, they injury, uh, we have not noted any injury to the, the cardiac structures with this balloon. Um, there are some case reports from other centers which they have in patients with a very deficient or floppy septum, they have ruptured the septum for because of this uh, uh, balloon. So, uh, but in our experience, we have not seen that. Uh, the other balloons are the nucleus, nucleus uh, balloon from Newman and Equalizer from Boston. The nucleus is now very difficult to get. Um, the first three are actually the long balloons, which are actually meant for the ASD sizing. The other two are sm small balloons. So small means the round balloons, the nucleus and the equalizer. Then I would specifically tell you that to use nucleus or equalizer, uh, nucleus, equalizer is slightly easily available in cases where you have a, a pediatric patient. Because we have found that when you put a very long balloon, 
we find that right from the pulmonary vein coming to the IVC, sometimes we, we find hemodynamic issues. And sometimes we, if the balloon has to be inflated for a longer time, we find that the IVC getting obstructed with a longer inflation time of the balloon. So a smaller, low, um, shorter balloons would be very useful in a pediatric subset. Otherwise, for an, for an adult, I think these uh, sizing balloons do, uh, do a beautiful job. Balloon sizing is the first step you do. We don't mandatorily do balloon sizing in all of our cases because we get a thorough 2D image and in some cases with the 3D image, I think we will get all the information which is required. And balloon is only for support and not for sizing. But in cases where you have a discrepancy, in cases especially when we have multiple ASDs or aneurysmal septum where sizing, is, sizing goes for a NOR with a routine 2D and 3D, we take a balloon sizing. That is one area where I will recommend to use balloons. We use balloons to size the multiple defect and accordingly take the size. This is especially important to avoid oversizing. Most of the divide uh, cases where we have multiple defects, annulus from septum, sizes of the defects are very small. Uh, we haven't seen very huge defects in the, in the context of aneurysma septum. So here, most of the time, we will be successful with the device. Uh, and we don't oversize it. That is more important. Uh, that is why the value of gore and helix of has come, which are actually non self centering have less metal and less metal overcrowding. So if you don't use them, I think it's better that you use a, a meticulous balloon sizing for these multiple defects. The balloon catheter as in the delivery sheets are placed across the defect and directed towards the ipsilateral or opposite pulmonary veins. We are not very particularly um, keeping in opposite direction because most of the time entry into right upper, left upper is quite easy. So we keep both the balloons as, the, as well as the delivery sheet both in the same pulmonary veins. If you fail, we will switch the device uh, uh, delivery from the right upper pulmonary vein. That has been our protocol. Uh, we are quite okay with it. We are not found any reason to change that. But um, some papers do suggest that they keep, some operators do deliberately keep both the balloon as well as the delivery sheet in the opposite direction from the beginning go. So the balloon is inflated to fully occlude the defect. I will probably change this occlude the term. I would say probably the sealing the defect. So we just need to seal the defect so that the device doesn't prolapse. The LA disc is open and pulled towards the inflated balloon. The constricted waist of the balloon is opened across the defect and the, the device, the constricted waist of the device is open so the, the the device will, will, be, will become like a uh, hourglass. And then um, you gently push the cable to release the tension. We will uh, explain to you. Uh, the balloon is then half deflated and then the tension is the cable is further relaxed by gentle push of the cable. The alignment of the disc naturally happen because of the push of the cable will make the V formation. I have already told you what is the V. And then you slowly and steadily deflate the balloon. And after full deflation, we give a TE confirmation of the position. The withdraw of the balloon shaft should be done in a gentle, gentle pull and rotation. Many of the cases, especially junior people, we have seen that once you, when they pull the, pull the balloon, we find that the, the entire device comes out because already we are having a very compromised defect complexity. Uh, we have to be very gentle in pulling it back the balloon. I recommend not to use reused balloons because they, are, they appear very, very bulky. The profile is much more wriggling. So it's better that we avoid them. And of course, finally, we have to check the device. So this is actually the fluoroscopic picture. So I wanted to tell you the steps because uh, this, this is worked in most of our cases. And now I will describe what I was uh, telling you in the previous two, three slides. So this is uh, the a transesophageal guided uh, ASD closure. This is the LA disc being opened. The position of the, uh, the wire is not very optimal, but sometimes the, uh, when we open the device, the, the entire balloon assembly seems to jet back. But nevertheless, in this case, it was giving good support. So I will explain to you what, what actually the balloon does. So for, for balloon assisted technique, the principle is that there should be some structure with, across the septum, which actually help us not help the LA disc to stay in LA uh, while the RA disc is deployed. So that is what the principle is. Most of the time with this complex, what happens is that the LA disc actually flips back into RA before the RA disc comes in. So we want to actually keep some support in the across the atrial septal defect so that we, there is always, when we do a conventional atrial device, the atrial septal device closure, there is always a lag of few seconds between the LA disc coming in and the RA disc coming in. So that lag period is minimized by the balloon because the LA disc is kept, kept on hold in the left, left atrial part of the septum by the time the RA disc is coming in. It's something like a, uh, like a, stop cock or something like a check which is kept in the septum so that it prevents the LA disc coming back to the eye. 
and this gives some extra time the time lag is reduced by 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 keeping the balloon because the, the delay disc will continue to stay on the left tail part and the ra disc goes in so in other words the balloon actually what happens is that it will help the la disc to stay in the la and then the waste is getting deployed and then the ra disc is going to come like this so it becomes an hourglass and then you slowly deflate this balloon so that is what is happening this is something like an hourglass and then you slowly deflate the balloon and you can see that this is a, as we do this it's very important as we do this you see this cable here you see the cable here and you see the cable here so it is we are actually pushing we will catch keep pushing this to make the v so this is what is called as a v the the, the defects will be the device legs will be separated the limbs of the device or the disc will be separated superiorly but at the same time it will be very much in close proximity or abetting to each other in the inferior portion of the setup the echocardiographic correlate of this we have already discussed when we discussed the transceiver feature so this is the posterior inferior part of the device is actually just very much approximated so this once we see this v shape the so called v shape in the lao view we are pretty much sure that the device is on good position and this is after the final release the pulmonary vein deployment uh, this is a best applicable when there is this is we coming to the second technique this is best applicable when there is a relatively smaller la and a larger device so we have an atrial septal defect and you have the pulmonary vein here the the thing is that if you start deploying from the pulmonary vein what will happen is that there is a chance that the entire device will come and then uh, hit in the in the la itself that we should not, should avoid so why we how we should avoid there should be some understanding of the distance the left atrium is having which can hold the device and the distance the length of the stretched ast device so one cannot be too deeper in you cannot be too deeper into the pulmonary vein so that everything comes out in a very short fashion and the device goes to sit like this that is not something acceptable at the same time one cannot be very too much of proximal like this sometimes sometimes like something like that where the the device is going to come back and then stay like this in the la itself because you don't have any anchoring in the pa so it should be an optimal calculated distance in the pulmonary vein which we actually deploy the device such that the la disc is just holding on please understand just holding on at the same time you you should have a, some calculation actually the device stretch length should be more than the length the or the distance between the la and the pulmonary vein also that means what i am trying to say is that actually by anchoring this we should be able to predict that the ra disc is going to come on the right atrial side of the ast so that is very important if you if, if we are able to achieve this then invariably this technique will work so the relatively smaller la and a relatively larger device is a perfect fit for this technique this actually the image i have alluding to you anchor it and then you push and then you push the cable once the anchoring and the deployment of ra disc is done you push it vigorously the cable and then try to unanchor the tip of the la disc this is a classical way of uh, raru pb technique so the device gets anchored into the pulmonary vein and then you push the ra disc so this is what i was telling so the distance between you you have to compromise here in the la you have a you should have a reasonable estimate and the length of the device and then it you once ra disc is confirmed on, um, by onto the ra side you should give a vigorous pull to the delivery cable and then you release the device i mean you I mean, you position the device so this is a case where you have a trans thoracic imaging guide and guide at a pulmonary vein deployment you can see the device in pulmonary vein here and the operator has a clear understanding about how the length of the device the device length as well as the la size so this is a fluoroscopy uh, with a t this is another case and uh, the device is getting deployed so this is a combination of the pulmonary vein and bat i was alluding to this works especially in cases where you have deficient infraposterior margin so that you device that you deploy the device in the pulmonary vein itself at the same time you have a um, balloon which is actually checking you can know that the balloon is not fully inflated the balloon is not fully inflated at the same time the device is getting deployed in the pulmonary vein so the, here the purpose of the balloon is just to have a check not to occlude fully the device or not to stretch the defect in any means this is la roof method this is basically an a stretching of the pulmonary vein method as this is especially applicable as i as i told you if la is not sufficiently um small or it's relatively bigger compared to the device probably this technique may work this is a dilator assistance technique some amount of support we give it um to for the device to come back and then sit in the proper position 
this is a case of multiple ISDs. What what happened was there is a there's a two defects. Consistently, we were going through the um, superior hole, so we wanted to devise the the inferior hole first. And so what happened was actually to to make it easy, what we did to be con since we are consistently going through the um, inferior superior hole, what we did is actually we put a balloon in the superior hole and we did a balloon sizing separately. So we had to cross both. So that once we closed this, once we ballooned the first one, uh, it was easy to cross the second one. So then we crossed both and then we ballooned, balloon size individually and then kept the first balloon uh, in the anterior defect itself and then put the device in the second one and then put the second one. So you can see the, the, the septal plane which is going like this. So again, this is a case, this patient had malalignment, this patient had a, septal aneurysms and all. So multiple ASD was closed with a multiple balloon assisted and multiple balloons and separate sizing. So we are nearing the end of the presentation. Uh, one must be always aware of the complications in complex defects. This is easy to give an hour of lecture on complex defects, but what, is, what it takes is actually, uh, can be sometimes very catastrophic. See, longer procedures times. Uh, if you do a lot of jugglery in the heart, a lot of procedures times, proper monitoring of the ACT, multiple wire exchanges, balloon exchanges, uh, multiple entry into the atrium, left atrium, pulmonary vein os, all these can cause very, very serious complications like cardiac injury, cardiac tamponade, multiple um, wire exchanges, um, de-airing. If you are not very meticulous, we can give to, give to both thromboembolism as well as air embolism. You may change the sheet multiple times, so that can lead to blood loss, vascular access issues. You may end up in device embolization because many of the defects are quite complex. The rims are supposed to be not holding the device properly. And when we use a complex technique, we should always remember that these are defects which are not going to be conventionally closed. So with the help of a modified technique, we are trying to make it amenable for a device. So that may not happen all the time and you may get any device embolization. And of course, as the time goes beyond half an hour, 45 minutes, one hour, you may end up in operator fatigue as well. So this is a patient who we have put, uh, this patient, this is a young girl, 20 years, she had complete baldness of the aortic rim. All the tissues were okay. All other rims were okay. And she was, it was measuring about 20 millimeter, we put a 22 millimeter defect. And within few minutes, the device embolized the pulmonary artery and uh, with uh, double axis, um, we snared uh, the device and then taken into the IVC and then retrieved uh, percutaneous ray. And then this patient, uh, we, we suspected that the, there was, uh, the, the LA disc was slipping down. We can see that there was no proper V here. It was like two parallel lines like this. So we probably thought that probably the alignment of the LA disc was not proper, even though echocardiogram really looked be best when we were able to release. So with a balloon assisted technique, we tried to close this device. So sometimes you can see the snare also is coming in. So there is a snare which is coming here. So something we call it as a snare assisted. Even after unscrewing it, the snare will hold the device and then slowly we release the square. This is an extra added step we use whenever uh, we had some delicate cases like this. So to conclude this, a complex ASD intervention, the size does matter, deficient rims do matter, deficient posterior rim is a challenge, especially when they have, they have deficient retroitic rim. Deficient IVC rim is a huge risk of embolization as well as heart block. 3D, 3D imaging is fast growing um, and it, in our hands, it helps extrapolating the 2D data. Modified techniques are very important. In our lab, almost like 60, 60 to 65 percentage, almost two thirds are being intervened with a modified technique. So that uh, shows us the complexity of the defects we did. Also that uh, shows us uh, the overall uh, practice which has been changed. The norms have been um, broken in a way in selecting the cases. Uh, obviously it has pushed down our target, our success rate to so somewhere from 94 to 95 to somewhere around 90 percentage. I must admit that. One or more of a combination of the techniques may work. Complications are also higher, as I was telling, when we intervene such complexity. And then one should be clearly aware and be prepared to face these complications. I think that's, uh, that summarizes my uh, presentation. Thank you all for uh, listening to this. Sure. Thank you, sir. That was very informative presentation. So now we have got question and answer. I'll just pose the first question in front of you. Yeah. So is there any 
eco cardiographic measurement to identify definite malignant of ias malalignment i would probably believe yeah yeah was mal- actually the malalignment uh, um, uh, there is no a uh, measurement as such but there are some uh, um, clues to identify whether malalignment is there as i was uh, to the the interpretation of the 2d um, transesophageal echo as you sweep from 0 degree to 45 degree and then from 45 degree to 90 degree just as we are watching the retroaortic tissue we should also focus on closely on the posterior ring and then you have to follow the line um, in which the um, septum is holding on from this sweep from 0 to 90 degree and if you consistently do that uh, you will understand that how the septal orientation is going to be there and then we we find that the septal alignment is in line with the coronary alignment coronary cusp alignment or it is deviating in our practice as we were i have told about 1/5 of patients do have posterior malalignment the degree of malalignment may be varying it may be from a few millimeter to a maximum of a centimeter but if there are minor man elements it may not really matter with regard to the success if there are major man element i think one must use a balloon or from driven deployment to get success at the same time we should also remember that there is an entity called anterior man element which is not very prevalent we might have seen in one or two cases but these cases were not def- uh, not intervened because they had other issues like complete absence of ivs rim and also these patients were sent for surgery but man element we should always always look uh, look for its presence and you will be surprised to see almost like 15 to 20 percentage of cases do have some kind of man element so uh, it is it is a it is well known many uh, many are under reported and once we started failing in some of the cases where the rims were adequate patient had a good ivc rim many of them didn't have a, a retroaortic rim but that we always take it uh, we find that uh, the management was the cause for uh, this thing and when we did uh, our analysis of the failure in addition to the ivc rim deficiency and posterior rim deficiency the third common factor for failure was actually the management Okay so sir next question is how many rims do you measure and see during toe and what are the views for the rims uh um, now uh, now i think uh, that's what i was also the purpose of the lecture was also like that you should not confine yourself to a specific uh, um, angle or a specific measurement um, you should do a complete sweep from 0 to 90 degree and to 120 to 130 degree to see the posterior most point of the septum and the posterior inferior portion of the septum so you should do a complete sweep understand the orientation of the defect understand the shape of the defect and once you spend 10 15 minutes in understanding the orientation and the and the location as well as the um, position of the defect then you start measuring how will you measure there is no simple um, angle to give you a suggestion that all cases you measure 30 degree or 45 degree by convention we used to take an anterior posterior diameter in a short axis and a supra inferior measurement in the long axis which is at a bicaval view 90 degree now again this angle the terminology is as 30 45 90 90 are arbitrary in a given case you may not get the longest uh, supra inferior diameter in 90 degree one of the images if you had closely seen the measurement i have taken was around 65 degree the ivc svc margin so this measurements will change now what 3d has brought into our uh, knowledge is that actually you should not confine or dedicate to this so called 30 45 and 90 degree you should be prepared to take a complete sweep and what that is what 3d has taught us rather than seeing the device in a two dimensional format you should always even if you don't do a 3d your your eyes should be tuned to a three dimensional picturization in your mind with regard to the measurements so if you if you it is a very small change in this is how you see the image if you see that uh, it is a three dimensional structure you have to orient yourself to a three dimensional way even if you don't do a 3d echo i think that will solve the question then you will know that a simple measurement in a particular angle is not going to help us it is going to be a complete sweep putting everything in together and then you go for the major or the maximum measurement you get in any of these sweeps vis-a-vis as minor measurement in any of these sweeps and that will make us, that will make it comprehensive Okay, so sir, next question is asking: septal aneurysm is 10 mm or 15 mm? 
the classical definition is uh, 15 mm. Uh, we uh, we tend to take any deviations uh, above more than 10 millimeters as aneurysm. We have seen some borderline cases where the aneurysm tissue is about 7 to 8 millimeter. Most of these situations, uh, it doesn't matter for transcatheter success. The important thing what we should understand is that if whether an ASD is there or not, that is number one. And number two is whether we need to put two devices or one devices if there is a multiple defect. So these are the challenges which may trouble us. Presence of settled aneurysm as such is not going to trouble the ASD intervention much. If the patient is having an ASD associated with, then the first question is number of the defects and how many we are going to intervene in which way. That, that, those are the two prime concerns. The classical definition is 15 millimeter. Many of the cases we take it as 10 millimeter also as a septal aneurysm. Okay, so what are the views of true posterior rim on transthoracic and transesophageal? Uh, the true posterior rim uh, definition has going to change. When we started our ASD device in 2000, 2008 or 2009, we were all uh, accustomed to taking the, uh, the uh, short axis view um, diametrically opposite to the iota, as well as the four chamber view. Uh, which is coming, uh, four chamber view is basically looked for the mitral rim. The rim which is coming opposite, superior to that rim was actually being tuned as the first thing. So as I was uh, telling you, there has been uh, some changes in fundamentally defining the rims. The true posterior rim is actually the right upper pulmonary vein rim or the rim which we measure in 120 to 130 degree transesophageal echocardiography. If someone is asking you how to measure a posterior rim, it, as you, as you again, I will, and I am now thinking in terms of, in my teaching also, I will try to push the point that it's, it's a three-dimensional picture. If, the, if, uh, if we have seen that uh, image I was showing you also, if the, the true posture is the one which is a opposite to the aortic bulge or aortic torus, and that is not one particular point that may have some part of the SVC coming in, that will have some part of the right upper pulmonary vein coming in, that part of some part of the radial wall coming in, and then it's, it's, it will going to end as uh, inferior vena cava. That is actually the, the, the posterior part or the posterior boundary of a, a second MASD. Now, if you ask me what are the specific angles we are looking at, I, I've already answered part, partially. The true posterior rim, we will look at 120 to 135 degree, uh, which is um, um, looking at the right upper boundary vein. Okay, so would request you to explain the V sign in LAO view. Um, uh, uh, my point uh, Steve. Is it visible? Uh, um, Hello. Uh, my PowerPoint is still visible. Any idea? Slides? No, sir. Hello? It is not visible right okay. now. The v yes, sign it is, is showing. It is yeah. showing, sir. Okay, okay, fine. So I think I will uh, tell you that. So the V sign is something which is uh, there when we when we deploy the device fluoroscopically. So this is a level view. The superior most the, the, the device is going to sit in such a way that it is going to uh, the sandwich the iota superiorly and anteriorly. So the the device is going to hold on to the aortic bulge in the atrial septum, whereas inferiorly it is going to have it is going to have a it is going to be supported by the infraposterior ring. So superior, the device is going to be splayed, really it is going to be together. So that is called as a V sign. The V, the, the disc seems to converge inferiorly. So this we can see it in the echo also. Okay, so sir, next question is, when there are two ASD and intervening tissue is large, can we close two defects by single device? Um, yes, Anjali, I will just complete the answer. So this is the V sign, you say that. If you, if in, the, in the short axis, we, we can see that the, both the discs are actually converging towards the inferior. Uh, coming back to the last question, which is actually whether to take two devices or one device. This is a major dilemma we take. Now, the, you have to see how far or how together these defects are. If they are very closely packed, arbitrarily, um, seen some values as eight millimeters, six millimeters, if the two defects are 
um, only sp um, uh, separated by six to eight millimeters, we can try to do with one device. If it's more than eight millimeter, we should take two devices. So this may not hold true because this eight millimeter distance in an aneurysmal or non aneurysmal septum measurement, it is going to be very, very difficult. There is no point in upsizing the device. Earlier, our, con our concept was actually, if you have a 20 millimeter hole in another four millimeter defect, so 20 plus, uh, if you take 20 mm, 20 mm defect, the LA, measure, LA disc measurement will be somewhere around 34. So, and the RA disc will be measuring somewhere around uh, 26 or 28. In other words, the 20 mm waste, suppose you take a 20 mm device, the RA disc is going to be somewhere around 30 and the LA disc is going to be somewhere around 38. So 38 to 40. So if we believe that if you put a very large defect, we're trying to close. Actually, it is not like that. The larger you close, the more um, standing of the defect and the, um, the more the difference between the device and the defect, the more is going to be the um, difficulty in closing the second shell. So you should not terribly oversize the larger defect to accommodate the smaller defect. And to add another point is some of these larger defects may be just a tissue tag. Sorry, some of these multiple defects. That should, should, should be very clearly understanding. Sometimes the, the separation, uh, what you see is actually a tissue tag and not a separate defect. I think 3D will help us in a great way in uh, differentiating. In my point, the only area where 3D we scores over the, as this they have highlighted, this I have uh, just hinted during my talk also, the only uh, major advantage of 3D over 2D is actually picking up these multiple defects and uh, looking to differentiate it from a, from a tissue tag vis-a-vis a, -vis a separate uh, defect. The answer, precise answer to the question is actually, there is no clear cut answer to that. If both are large, moderate size to, moderate size to holds, try to close with two devices. If they are the one, if the, the smaller one is less than five millimeter, leave the smaller one and close the bigger one. Okay, so the so next yeah. question is, uh, can you explain anatomy of SV, ASD and balloon assisted PV technique? Uh, the SVASD is actually a um, deficiency of the septum, a deficiency of the septum which separates the um, um, superior vena cava and the right upper pulmonary vein. And when that happens, the patient will have a, an anomalous right upper pulmonary vein which is draining into SVC and there is a, an ASD which is actually a kind of a, something called as an absence of roof or absence of separation. This is not to be taken into an ASD at all. When we take about ASD, it is basically a septum secundum defect or when there is a deficiency of the septum secundum or septum, then we call it, with, when there is a fossa avalis type of defect, sorry. And if there is a fossa avalis type of defect, that is a secondum. Embryologically, they are different. I think now we have a means uh, of closing uh, sinus venous or ASD also by trans catheter means by putting covered stents. So what does it tell you? If you put a covered stent between in the S, from the SVC to RA, covering the opening of right upper pulmonary vein, we are actually closing the hole of ASD. So that therapy itself will tell you that the fundamentally, that's what I told you, the fundamentally it is a different. You one should not bring in an SV ASD into when we discuss an OIMS, OSTIM second and So they are two separate diseases. There's two separate embryology and anatomically they are different. Treatment is different. So once you take that message, I think there is no need to confuse. And the second question was, Anjali, uh, can sir, you? Yeah, so is it possible to close SVC type sinus venosus defect by percutaneous intervention? Um, it is possible, I think, uh, uh, because we, the, the concept is very simple. Uh, even though there are no patented devices exclusively meant for that, a lot of um, uh, work is going on. Some of them are getting delayed because of this COVID. Uh, the, the fundam we will put a covered stand actually. We put a covered stand starting from the SVC uh, to the right atrium, uh, sealing the right pulmonary vein, um, uh, pulmonary vein communication to SVC. So that happens. The, um, that once you put it correctly, a lot of uh, um, it, um, measurements and a lot of uh, imaging as well as CT measurements are involved with this. But to understand, we put it simply, you uh, deconnect, uh, I repeat, you deconnect uh, uh, right upper pulmonary vein and SVC. And that is a treatment for SVASD. It is possible. Okay. But not so with any Yeah. Okay. So, sir, next question is, one of the doctor is asking then uh, that when they are trying to deploy the device that is coming perpendicular to the atrial septum, uh, what is the best thing to do in this case? 
uh, see, uh, see, it's also what we have understood is actually, um, see, please, please be meticulous in imaging. Uh, see, ASD intervention, if properly planned, should not take more than 15 to 20 minutes uh, uh, of fluoro. In other words, if you're, once you cross the ASD, then it should, it should, the, the intervention should finish between, within 15 to 20 minutes. If this doesn't happen, then that means we have gone wrong something in our basic uh, calculation. And that error mostly is going to be the understanding of the anatomy. So once that happens, uh, then we should go back and check what is anatomical challenge. Now, um, if someone is telling, sir, this patient is having a complex ASD, I have noted that this particular margin is deficient and the septum is malaligned, so, but the device is not going to work conventionally. Then there is a meaning to that. Then that immediately will tell you to adopt uh, uh, one of the modified techniques I have. Uh, you can try the lunar assisted technique and also try a plumbing technique. Please, all the one I have showed in the 3D also, if you have a very central ASD, we can actually devise with the maximum measurement. Like if it's a major axis is 20, you can close with the 20 or at the max 22 mm. But if there's any of the complexities which I have alluded, except the ASA, the atrial septum aneurysm and multiple, or so-called perforated aneurysm, if you don't have that, or ex ex excluding that for all other variations, you please go for plus three or plus four. That is the safest bet. But when you do that, please make sure that you are not dealing with a small child. You are not compromising, compromising on the uh, vital proximate structures like mitral valve. If you are very sure of that, my recommendation is that to go for plus three or plus four with any of the modified techniques, either pulmonary vein or balloon assisted. Okay, so sir, next question is, if the rims are too small for the placement of device, then operating is the only way? So they want to know this. The rims are, uh, again, we have to go in totality. Uh, there are many defects in, uh, as I told you, two thirds of our cases are like this only. So we need to measure that the, uh, the maximum um, size of the device that it can hold. There is a concept called the total atrial septal length also. I didn't mention that for want of time. Uh, somebody is measuring the entire atrial septal length and then we'll, we'll calculate the maximum um, area where the LA, because LA is going to be small and RA is going to be, uh, sorry, yeah, RA is going to be big in an ASD. So the L, if it is going to touch the atrial wall, it's going to the mitral or the AV valve, it's going to be happening on the left atrial part. So someone has to be very clear with regard to what kind of an oversizing the LA will admit. So if you measure the total atrial septal length and then see whether what is the, the, the maximum um, length of the LA disc or measurement of the LA disc it can hold, that can roughly give you uh, uh, a clear-cut understanding of what is the maximum oversizing you can go. This we have not sci studied scientifically. In smaller children, uh, say let's say two-year-old, three-year-old children, we are actually meticulously doing this. We have not published this data the data, something which we are not scientifically able to prove or publish now, we cannot say. But in smaller children, where, where there is a greater concern with regard to the, um, the, the optimal oversizing which is possible. Let's say we have a child two, two, years, or two years old, the ASD is measuring about 20 millimeter. We know that it is going to be a complex. Size is a major limit here. We cannot upsize too much. I am trying with a 22, 22 is failing. I am trying with a 24, 24 is failing. And then it, I have to take a call in the cantilever, whether the whether this child has to go for an elective surgical closure or whether should I try with a 26 mm. When I try to take a 26 mm in this case, I will clearly measure the atrial septal length. I will see whether the 26, there is no point in closing the ASD with a, a left rated disc hitting the mitral valve. Even though, even though, I repeat, even though this does not cause any MR, the, the disc to touch the mitral annulus, the mitral leaflet, but while leaflet is acting, mind, mind you, this is a two-year-old child and he has years of life ahead. We really don't know the feature of this device touching the mitral valve. Even though, by logical sense, we will say that as the child grows, the atrial septum will also grow. So, with time, the, the, the device which was hitting the mitral annulus is going to go away the mitral valve, go away from the mitral valve. That we should understand. But again, 
abscising limit should be uh, can, cannot be um, told um, openly as okay you go for 20 mm device you go up to 26 it is not something which we cannot say but when we say that we are going plus 4 or more you always have a um, understanding of what maximum the la can hold okay Hello? yeah so sir next question is is it possible to get plsv complicated with os asd uh, plsv uh, what does it mean plsvc so persistent left superior vena cava yes 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 and that may not really disturb with your intervention we have done uh, many cases of persistent left spc and that may not have any uh, implication uh, they may have a dilated coronary sinus um uh, can have some issues uh, but not with respect to the asd we should always of course any less to say you should look for any other associated defects which are associated with it but um, that is not something which we are um, really worried about as far as ostium secundum defect uh, closure is concerned Okay, so sir, next question is: If coronary sinus rim deficient is there, is it possible to close? There is one case we have done, uh, but I think uh, this is entirely a surgeon's domain. If you have an unroofed coronary sinus, in my talk I have told is that the rims. See, a central hole is very easy to image. I think I will reiterate this point: a central hole is very easy to try to, to image, but. these are extremely um, uh, peripherally located defects there's something which you are alluding to that is a is a completely inferior defect um, which is the coronary sinus which is towards the medial part that part of the septum that is 2d or 3d it is very difficult to image and if if you image and find a defect by default it goes to the surgeon but if you, if you say that there is an ostium secundum masd which is extending very inferiorly near to the coronary sinus os then that is something which we definitely try and of the one of the cases which we have tried is actually this i am aware there are two or three case reports where people have published device closure of asds with deficient coronary sinus margin it's okay it is acceptable but someone is telling that isolated coronary sinus defect they have devised that cannot be acceptable that has not been done also so these are very 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 rare exceptions and um, here actually we have to go by case to case Uh, it will all depend on what is associated with it. If the patient is having a you know OS ASD, which has got a deficient inferior margin separating from the coronary sinus, I think there is no harm in trying. But if you are if you are trying to say about the the, the, the classical unroofed coronary sinus or something, which needless to discuss in this thing because that is an entirely different uh, de defect and that eventually is a surgeon's call. Okay, so sir, next question is: Do you perform a spatial technique for the absent aortic rim? In some operator, I see that they embrace the aortic rim with the two discs of the device. What should I do to embrace the aortic rim? See, fifty uh, percent of your patients who do have absent aortic rim. Now, when we approach from the um, right femoral vein or the left femoral vein, then you go and cross the defects. most of these patients with uh, retroaortic rim deficiency are anterior defects and two thirds i would say two thirds of them do have a good posterior inferior margin in such cases this may not be a great deal of difficulty in positioning the device but as the one case i have shown in a young girl who had an embolism this patient had all the rims adequate despite that the la disc failed to stay in the la and that is flipped back into ra my humble suggestion to you is actually use some kind of a modified technique where we want the la disc to stay in la for a few seconds before the ra disc comes into its position if you are able to do that i think you will be able to succeed now if this doesn't work then we have to think that in addition to retroaortic rim deficiency this patient is going to have some other issues also one we might have underestimated the strength and the efficacy of a posterior rim or inferior rim second there should be a posterior malalignment if that is going to happen then definitely i would take a balloon assisted technique i may even with the recent experience i would even combine a balloon assisted with pulmonary vein technique and we have been quite successful with these cases where there is combined deficiency of aortic rim as well as deficiency of 
posterior inferior end. Okay, so sir, next question is: Does all ASD need to close even if we detect it incidentally at different age group? So that is actually a different uh, topic where we have to discuss on the indications of ASD closure, the timing of ASD closure, and uh, when we should not close an ASD. So since it's asked, I will tell ASD if the patient is having right atrium, right ventricular overload. Preferably, all ASD should be closed. If you say the data, I would say probably before 21 years, that is the age limit. Now, if someone is planned to close an ASD for a paradoxical embolism or migraine, a small ASD, we are talking about patients who do not have any hemodynamic issues in terms of RAR volume overload. The other indications would be a migraine or someone who is having a paradoxical embolism. Definitely, those are indications. Someone whom you want to who do the ASD closure for preventing atrial fibrillation. The teaching is that you have to do it before 40 years of age. But in an isolated case of an asymptomatic, incidentally detected pre-op or kind of a medical, executive medical check checkup, it all depends on the degree of shunt. If the degree of shunt is QP by QS is more than 1.5 is to 1, it is better to close. Because as we grow old, we know, and as we grow old, the left ventricle becomes stiff, stiffer. We may end up contacting or getting a, a hypertension or coronary artery disease. And these patients, ASD in the combination of a left heart disease, they do, do not do well. I'm talking about a patient who is completely asymptomatic and who has evidence of significant shunt in terms of RARV volume overload or the measured QP by QS either by echo or by catheter is more than or equal to 1.5. Of course, and they're coming to the last part, whom you don't close. Patients who have RV hypoplasia, patients who have uh, significant left ventricular dysfunction, patients who have RV dysfunction, patients who are associated with uh, other complex anomalies, uh, AST cannot be closed in isolation. So there are other many, many uh, don'ts are there, including patients who have pulmonary vascular disease, now obstructive type. Okay, so sir, next question is, if device embolization occurs, what's the approach for retrieval? Uh, device embolization uh, in our lab, it is uh, completely retrieved by percutaneous means. I would say, uh, barring one or two of our earlier cases, which happened years back, most of the cases which embolize, we were able to retrieve it. But one must admit that, when the device embolizes, uh, it is going to be a morbid procedure for the patient because the procedure time goes. Most of the cases we have do we do ASD, we, even with T, we do under conscious sedation, so anesthetic is not around because the, it's a high volume place, so you can't ask anesthetist to come for all ASDs. So uh, uh, all adult ASDs go with a local anesthesia and conscious sedation. And ASD when device when a device embolizes, definitely it takes time to retrieve it. Right. We use vascular snares. We may sometimes use extra axis like left femoral vein if it is already not punctured, the jugular vein, because as you know, pulmonary artery uh, access is much easier through jugular. If a uh, device which has embolized to the RP or LP, it's very difficult to catch by the hook, the so called the pin, which is around the right atrial part. So you have the left atrial hub as well as a, the right atrial pin. So we need to hold the device, snare it with the pin. So that has to happen sometimes consistent entry into the pulmonary artery becomes an essential uh, part and sometimes you may have to take a jugular access also. We have to upsize the sheath, whatever uh, sheath you are using 12 French or 14 French to 16 French. We call it as purple sheath. I think Amblax now, now the, uh, the Abbott people, they, they have this. So we immediately swap to uh, uh, so-called retrieval sheath. We take uh, a Jatkins catheter and we take a thermohydrophilic wire, J-tip, we reach the device as much as possible. So if, for example, if it is an RV or PA, we try to reach the, make the sheath reach as proximal to the device as possible. And inside the sheath, like a mother and child, like a, a Jetkins right will go. If not, Jetkins right, a, a multi-purpose will go. With the thermo wire, we try to reach near the device, precisely near the hub. And then we'll exchange this wire for a vascular snare, which can be a single loop or multi-loop, and then we try to snare. If the device is com completely mobile, or because it's excessively mobile, there have been cases where we have taken an alternative jugular access, 
gone into PA, you fix the device with a biopton or a catheter, and then try to snare by the femoral veins. So there is no hard and fast single approach. We should re remember that uh, this is an emergency and catastrophe. It doesn't happen often, but when it happens, it's going to be an emergency. The thing you should do is actually call some resident or call someone to take care of the patient because the patient will become irritable. Device hanging in RVOT will cause a lot of ventricular arrhythmias. Patient will become stable. So somebody should be there for the patient. Then you call an, um, uh, call up the surgeon. The surgeon has to be in backup because sometimes you may fail. Even though that doesn't happen often, sometimes you may fail, number two. Number three, you order for blood because again, you need to take up multiple sheets, jugular access, the exchange for large sheets, blood um, um, loss may be unimaginable. Un we may not realize it, but patient can go to severe blood loss after the procedure, even if after successfully retrieved. So blood, ar blood arrangement is important. And then you go on with uh, your technique. Never, never get panic. That is the most important thing you should remember. The first operator, whoever has, is doing this, should be extremely calm. Uh, so that is something which I have considered. Because if you become very panicked and anxious, your team members will become panicked. So it should be very essential that you consult the patient. You say that nothing is there. The, device, the intervention is going to take a little bit more time. Have patience. Have patience to snare the device. And if it, it works. When you are not tense, the team members are also are very comfortable. When we become panic, everything will be panic. And in panic times, I think our sense doesn't work. The brain is in a different mode. Nothing which is logistic and possible will work. And I think once, once you snare it, you just pull back and try to pull back into the sheath as close as possible. There have been some cases where we, have, uh, we were able to retrieve the device, but we were not able to come out of RV because the device got entrapped in the code. Then we have to release and uh, retrap it or re-snare it. And if you are not very careful, we can injure the tricuspid code also. So these are things which you should understand. Okay. So, sir, next question is, in balloon-assisted technique, do you prefer specific PV engagement for balloon positioning depending on specific rim deficiency? No, no. Actually, this has been our uh, technique earlier when we, we were very, very kind of uh, methodically and religiously entering the pulmonary vein. But with time, we realized that actually the balloon is going to support uh, the, the septum uh, and not the LA. So, if you get a good support, um, you can even do away with the entering into the pulmonary vein. See, pulmonary veins, left atrial appendages are very soft portions. And as far as possible, try to not to injure them or engage them multiple times. Because those are the areas going to perforate and terminate is going to happen. So, these cases, uh, if it is there, stable, then it's fine. But if it is not there also, if your balloon is stable, uh, we are not very particular to park it in the pulmonary vein. Okay, so sir, this is the last question. How do you decide whether ASD close percutaneous or surgical? No, it's very simple. I think the case selection is something which is, uh, uh, which is done in the echo lab, not in the cath lab. Of course, in the rare, rarest of the rare cases, when even after 2D, 3D, we realize that the device is not going to be getting closed in the cath lab. So we refer to the surgeon. Um, barring that, I think uh, most of the decision uh, of whether it's surgical or device has been taken in the echo lab itself, not in the cath lab. Now, the basic principle is, is that actually the device is very large. So the defect is very large, so less than 40, 44, 45, 46. The largest ASD we have closed is about 45 millimeter. I am aware that there are some operators who have done 48 also in the country. But I think this value may not have any, any real sense. Uh, closing a 48 or 45 is not a great deal because as long as we, you understand the anatomy, how in a 45 mm defect, if you are putting, or for that matter, even a 48 mm device defect, if you're putting a 50 mm device, if you know that how is this 50 mm device is going to hold well, safely, without interfering with any of the uh, neighboring structures and embolization, then it is fine. It is not a problem of size alone. But as I discussed, sometimes the size may be too high and the size, the enlarging size will compromise on the margins. Someone who is having a complete deficiency of inferior posterior rim, I think I would say no. Sometimes who are have somebody, somebody who is having an extreme malalignment of the septum, which you have failed, which we have failed even after upsizing to plus six or plus eight, I think you should back out. Someone is having a 20 mm device defect, you planned with a 22 mm device, you go in, you fail with 22, 24, 26, 28, 
then you should know that the, the, the size you have measured as 20. Now you're trying to close it with a 28 or 30 mm. This is something which is not acceptable. You may ultimately end up succeeding by closing with a 30 or 30 or 32, but that is not the way to do. There is something which we have missed out completely in our imaging. We should go back and check. If not, the patient has to go for surgery. A patient who had devices embolized twice, I repeat twice, I think that patient should safely be sent to surgery rather than trying with a third device and waiting for it embolized. So these are some of the um, basic common sense steps. But as such, uh, it all depends on the anatomy. Uh, and uh, it, it may vary from patient to patient. It's hard and fast. It is very difficult to say hard and fast rules saying that, okay, if you have X, Y, Z, you just send for surgery. It is not like that. And practice has been evolving. What the ASD, which I used to refer for surgeon 10 years back, now I may devise it. And it keeps evolving also. Sometimes the, 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 the on the contrary can also happen. Sometimes I would have devised something earlier. Now I would have sent to surgeon because of some concerns. So these are issues uh, which is cannot be generalized. But by, by and large, a very large defect. You don't have a defect to close. It's yes, no. That has to be surgically treated. Number two, if you have failed repeatedly in the cath lab, needless to say, that patient has to go to surgeon. Second, three, third one is actually extremely peripherally located. Extremely peripherally located, we are, whether you are unsure of. Let's say a, a totally inferiorly and posteriorly def posterior defect, you are unsure about the IV stem, you are unsure about the posterior rim, then you pl please send for surgery. Com complete or disorganized anatomy of the atrial septum, please send for surgery. If there is a case where there is an atrial septal aneurysm, there are multiple defects, you are not able to figure out what are the sizes of these defects. It may be a perforated aneurysm where there may be four or five holes. It is practically impossible for us to close each and everything. That patient may be safely sent for surgery. Patients with ASD who have associated mitral valve disease in the form of mitral regurgitation. I think you should, one should not envisage into uh, even contemplating a device and planning AS mitral valve surgery later. That should be, patient should be safely sent for surgery. So these are my general comments on this question. Okay, thank you so much, sir, for giving your time. And even the chat box is flooded with uh, lots of good words and appreciation, stating that it is a very excellent and lucid presentation. Thank, thank you. you so much, sir, and thank you to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you, the Philips team, especially Ranjit and um, Anjali, uh, for uh, a well-coordinated session. I thank you and uh, wish you all good health.